somebody is being disruptive or whatever. Right, right. So. Okay, let's see. Ooh, I can, oh, look, it says live on YouTube right there in the top left hand corner. This, Sorry, I'm gonna close some of my windows here so that. I'll check our channel and see where. Yeah, it's, I'm looking at it right now. Oh God, it's got feedback. Oh, please, no. Okay. <laughs> oh yeah, I can see it now. Let's see. Everybody smile. You're live on YouTube to however many followers EMSS has. <laughs> is there is there any reason why we're we're so we not stream this on YouTube, Amanda? Since no one, I mean. Oh, you're on mute. Yeah, <laughs> we didn't have. Um, I think no one had a YouTube channel that we. Sorry. That they want. Yeah. So we just said we can use ours. Um, we probably could have sent a like an email out again to like a reminder had maybe next time we can send yeah. a reminder email out to like the first year group that we sent the first year on the 40 email yeah. to and say reminder great event tonight check it out on youtube or here's at ems right. yeah so should yeah. i just can't should i just stop this this live or just let it go i think you can just let it go okay i'll just leave so it up it's up to you guys um i want to see what it's like on youtube yeah, and I think too is that we figured out so late that we wanted to do that that I think that was it too. Like now we know, like like you're saying too, like next time we can send out like we're also going to put it on YouTube. But this time it was uh, right up until like Little. yesterday, I think. <laughs> it's so crazy. So Seven twenty. We have eighty one subscribers, so you know. There we go. It's actually really not that bad considering that the YouTube page, like I just recently created it, like what, three, four months ago? Yeah. So. You're doing good things, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see, I'm gonna put you guys on mute and check it out. And you know, I use HelloFresh or have you heard of it? I've heard of it, yeah. But they like sometimes send random things. They sent me like this, like, polar seltzer it's actually pretty good <laughs> ah nice i was thinking about doing that is it called irregular foods or imperfect foods or what is that uh, there's so many right now it's crazy. yeah it's something where it's like they send you almost like the ugly produce that they won't like send to the stores but there's nothing wrong with it other than it's like misshapen or something oh yes i've heard about that yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> and people won't buy it because they're like oh my god why does my apple look like an orange that's right that's right Okay, this is so weird because I have I have us up on Zoom and on YouTube. I'll put the YouTube in the chat so you guys have the link. It's also in the top left. If you click on that uh, yeah. YouTube link, you can view uh, stream on YouTube or copy streaming link. I'm guessing for, since it's just a regular Zoom, um, if somebody has this on gallery, if we have like 200 people, then it's going to be a gallery of 200 people, right? It's not going to. Sorry. <laughs> It'll be, um, well, I don't know. You know Which, if that's the case, we could just type a message saying, if you're looking at 200 people and you don't want to, just change your view to speaker view. Speaker view, yeah. I think the max is 40 per page. Or, yeah, I have whatever the max is, it'll yeah. probably end up populating that. OK, I'm going to keep doing work till. Yep, I'll let um, I'll let you know. few moments. No, I mean, I'm going to stay on and, and listen. Um, 
just not not be actively antisocial. Just <laughs> that you know that I'm <laughs> sounds good. We're all multitasking. <laughs> no problem. Multitasking. So Brian, what has your career taken you since oh you graduated God. from ITF? So many places. Um, well, now I'm at UT. I work for, with EMSS. I'm the multimedia producer for uh, enrollment management and student success. But when I graduated, I actually moved to New York. Did you ever know Lauren Grush, who also kind of worked with me a lot, especially at TSTV? She, um, man, she's doing great things too. The alumni for TSTV is really great. She, she's now a uh, writer and uh, reporter for uh, that. Oh man, what's the name of it? It's that really popular science, uh, science blog. I don't even know if they call it a blog. Like, oh my God, I can't remember the name of it. It's really annoying. Anyways, um, she lives in New York and works for them now. I moved to New York when I graduated. I moved there with my wife because uh, my, my fiance at the time because she uh, was going to NYU for grad school. Mm -hmm. And while I was in New York, I worked on a couple of features. Um, I was there for just over a year. And then we moved back to Austin. And when I got here, I was in television for a while. I worked at CBS Austin. Um, I worked at CBS Austin. Actually, it was weird. I had to go backwards because I was working in nothing but movies. But then we were like, well, we're going to move back to Austin. And I was like, well, Texas doesn't, doesn't really have the amount of production that New York or LA has. But we really wanted to, to be back close to family. So when we came back, I went into television. But because I was only doing like PA and uh, second AD and stuff on films in New York, I ended up having to be a uh, I was the lead editor for just the news during the Bastrop fires, oh, which wow. was insane. Yeah. Um, and I, I did that and moved into promotions and I was creating, you know, I was a, a promotions producer for news, which actually took me into advertising and all that happened within like a year and a half. And I've been in, I was in advertising for about a decade and I just left and came here because I felt part of my soul was dying. <laughs> <laughs> I got really sucked into it. It was it was really fun, and that world was so different from going from film to TV to advertising. I, um, it was just it was wild because they're all so different. Yet I thought they'd all be the same. Yeah. Um, and especially when I, my first intro to advertising was with a guy named Steve Lockoff and a group of like there's like only five of us, and it was like mainly car advertising, uh -huh. which I feel like is soulless TV. <laughs> I did that for like four years. Yeah. Um, it's like a specialty. I, yeah. Early in my career, I worked for a guy who was a cinematographer, and they 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 basically turn. I heard to DPs who they like they specialize in car advertisements. They call them sheet metal specialists. Yeah. They yeah, I did. Uh, tricks for uh, lighting, sheet metal, shining flat objects. I did that. I did the whole thing. I was uh, what I but I since he was so small, he hired me because of my capabilities in post and in. Uh, as a cinematographer so I did all of it for him and I oh, even wow. helped him build a uh, 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 oh my what are the what are they what do you uh, what are the deals called that run on like 4 a.m in the morning for an hour and infomercials, infomercials. 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 yes I made it I made the infomercial for Niall Maxwell so if you ever turn on Niall right. Maxwell with with uh, uh, Mike Wilson <laughs> at the super center that's still happening now that's the infomercial that I helped build cool. um so I did that for four years and then I actually moved into uh, promote, uh, I moved into advertising with like events and restaurants. And then I did that all the way up until I started here at UT. Okay, cool. Do you have any children? I do, I have a two year old. Two year old, okay, yeah. She was, um, when she was born, that was like my catalyst for like, I think I need to get out of advertising Yeah. and go back and do stuff that I really wanna do um, that doesn't, put me in with the kind of people I was hanging out with. Yeah, yeah. I can't, I left uh, uh, Troublemaker Studios shortly after my daughter was born. And it's a priority shift, right? Yeah, it, uh, it changed everything. I was like, yeah. so this is changing my life. I was actually freelance for a little bit because I like, I just wanted out. I was like, I'm just going to go out. And then I knew if I removed myself from it, it would make it easier for me to apply to jobs that I saw more of a future with, even though 
the, I mean, the pay, right? Like I was, you know, the amount of money I was making in advertising was stupid. So I was like, I need to just leave it, go freelance. And then that'll, that'll remove that restriction that I, I kept putting on myself to do something else. Cool. So, and it's been really nice. I love, I, I mean, I love UT. So I didn't yeah. realize I forgot how much I loved it until I got back. And I've been here for four months now and it's just been easily the best job I've had. Yeah. When I left Troublemaker Studios, I took a, a 50% pay cut, but my per, per hour wages went up because I wasn't working 100 hours a week anymore. Oh yeah, right. Yeah. Actually, I wonder if I did that, if it would, I probably would go up because I was working yeah. so much. Yeah. All right, awesome. We have somebody trying to coming in in the waiting room. That's awesome. Do we want to wait till six to admit people? I think that they, we should wait until the professor's here. We can message okay. the people in the waiting room saying we'll be starting in just a couple minutes. But wait until the main speaker's in and set up before we let everybody else in. Yeah, that's smart. And his name again is? Uh, Rich Reddick. And he just texted me and said he'll be there in one minute. Because oh, I texted wow. him to right. be like, here's the link again. Where are you? So, okay. oh, Malik is a staff member here. Oh, so, oh, okay. so we can just admit, uh, I can admit him. Hey, Malik. <laughs> Hello. You're the, you're the first one here. You beat Dr. Reddick here, Malik. <laughs> You'll be muted too when you come in. It'll auto mute you. There we go. Okay, now we're getting, I think, some students too, who I don't think we have to admit if they're students, but I'm That's not sure. That's interesting. So, um, Oh, so I do have more people coming in. Did okay, I? Do you want me to, let me put up the share screen slide. Here comes Rich. Yeah, I, it, I was saying, like, I have to do this meeting because I'm getting fussed up by Patty. There you go. See, he knows who's in charge. Rich, I know how to respond. Malik. At any, <laughs> at any point, are you going to need uh, to do slides or screen share, Rich? Oh, he left me. Yeah, I, I, I have a slide deck to keep me disciplined. Okay, so then let me... As co-host, you'd be able to do do that, sure. right? Okay. I will. I will. So let me, I'm going to put up a screen right now. Can you all see that screen now? Yeah, just full screen. Okay. Let's see. Uh, okay. Did that work now? There mm -hmm. we go. Oh, no, it didn't. No, we're still, you're still on PowerPoint. It did work for a second there. Yeah. Okay. Hold on. There we go. There we go. Just so you all know, we're going to have power, we're going to have Zoom fails. I'll be responsible for that, just so you know. <laughs> nice. Not you, Patty, but I will. Nice. Well, thank you. So, Rich, um, so we're going to obviously give it a little bit and uh, see how many students show up. But um, we have the chat turned off, but we have Q&A turned on. So if I get any questions that seem urgent or timely, I'll find a way to just jump in there and let you know. Otherwise, if you ever have a break and you want to just say, "Hey, is there any questions in the, you know, in the Q and A?" Then I'll monitor those, sort of as we. Yeah. Go. Um, just a heads up: the kids are home. I, I believe it's pretty calm in there, uh -huh. but yeah. there might be a thirteen or ten-year-old flying through the screen. <laughs> Usually, it's like, "What is the problem? Like, you know, <laughs> why can I hear you through the glass?" You know. Right. Right, right. Exactly. Not something we endorse in the house, but I, you know, I love, I love the fact that uh, we're meeting everybody's kids and everybody's pets uh, through this process. Agreed, agreed for sure. That's what I was saying earlier today. I thought the Zoom was a very interesting working atmosphere because it provides you a window into people's personal lives. Right. right. And they perhaps aren't really ready to share. Right. Right. <laughs> but, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> but it's, 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 it's super humanizing. I was talking to a group of faculty about that. I'm like, look, uh, let's, let's embrace the fact that our students don't get often get some chance to know that we in fact have people in our lives who can stand our presence more than an hour. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we have pets. Right. Uh, super humanizing. I have a quick question for y'all. How do I see the Q and a, if there is any Q and a, It'll, if, if anybody's going to, because we have an open chat, ah, okay. they can, they can type in chat any questions. I think it's probably what. Oh, okay. That sounds good then. Um, I don't know if Brian will be the only person that can see the 
uh, chat window if somebody texts the chat because it says to host they can chat to the host but okay i don't know oh, if that okay. means co-host can see it or not well are we are we doing it to youtube because if not then we can change who the host is right or yes yeah, sure i can change the host to you i wonder if it'll just break youtube i'm just going to do it and see what happens okay let's go for it do it take chances <laughs> for science Pull the plug that's right Nope, still on YouTube. Still good. You're the host now. Okay, I'm the host now. Okay, so let me see if I can see. Well, I can see the chat. Oh, I see. They can chat questions, but only to me. Is that right? Okay. You you should be able to see the chat. Could you make me co-host so I can control that YouTube? Yeah. Let's see. Yeah, okay, and then Rich, your co-host. Okay. Awesome. Excellent. Can we try something out real quickly? Can I do a quick uh, little tech check real quickly? Yeah, hang on one sec. Let me do it, but um, let me get out of this. Oh, hold on one second. There is somebody watching on YouTube. Oh, that's probably Amanda. No, I think I'm on like <laughs> on two different, on like Safari and Chrome because I was checking it. So I think that's okay, Rich, it. go ahead and uh, I, you should be able to share your screen now. Shout out to Nicole who followed me from the other meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Double dose. Okay, y'all can see that, right? Correct. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Crap. Oh, um, you know what, Rich? Yes. Can you see that? Yes. Can you see that? There you go. Yes. Okay. That's what I want to check. Okay. So okay. I you might be a little embarrassed. Be... To... Oh, go ahead, Rich. I'm embarrassed to say this, but I just learned how to make my PowerPoints not go into presentation mode. Because I don't, I don't want that. I want it just to have the screen anyway. So, pat on my back for that. Nice. I'm proud of it. If y'all aren't, I am. I'm very proud. <laughs> so, I was not even six o'clock yet. Wow, early participants. I love that. That makes me happy. Well, people, you know, they want to get a good seat. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we, we could actually make so, so like a bandwidth issue. So like you have the best bandwidth if you get on right away. So that would make people actually want to show up on time. Ah, nice. Clever. Clever. Doctor. Says the person who's had bandwidth issues all day. That's so, right. That's right. I may freeze middle of this thing, but I'm sure you all will bail me out. That's right. We'll help you out. We'll wait on you. And I've also discovered I'm getting really good at like leaving meetings like in 30 seconds. You know, Patty, I'm terrible at that, right? I, but I, 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 I'm now able to like say, okay, I've got a Zoom coming up right now. I got to go. Bye. Click. He's, he's good. It's, it took lots of training and. Uh... <laughs> yeah, I'm not great at it, but I, I am better. But I, I will tell you, um, I'm still trying to figure out like there's that uncomfortable moment when you hit the, you know, the red exit button and it says leave meeting. And you're kind of fumbling and so you're like bye and you're like hold a second let me just get out of here <laughs> really bye bye this time like i wish we could just like hit it and just be gone like, right 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 i think if you're the host that happens right or if you're the host and you want to leave the meeting and people are still talking you have to make sure you right. don't leave the meeting <laughs> you all talk amongst yourselves or It'll breakout be. rooms where you know you're talking and having a great talk and you're like mid sentence and just cut you off <laughs> <laughs> They're going back to the main room. Get out of the breakout room. I like us, us human beings who are like, oh, come and talk and you know, share this. Like, no. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. Cool. I think we're going to wait another probably five minutes before we start uh, Dr. Ray. I should have had some uh, music going. I didn't think yeah, about interstitials that. music. Well, you know, it's going to convey a message. We'd have to agree on what we think is appropriate music. <laughs> you always play music DM in classes, right? Yeah. Like, thematically, right? Yeah, a little <laughs> DMX maybe, right? You know, something like that. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what. A little Cardi B. 
That's right. Oh, God. Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> Even, yes, it could be reggae uh, in the league. But um, I, I, I will say I am enjoying the different remixes and um, Cardi B sort of, uh, I guess, memes that are going out there. So. <laughs> I mean, it's Cardi B's world. We just live in it. So there you go. Nice, nice. Uh, Rich, what class were you coming from? Your plan two, what, what is it? What's yeah, the so uh, Nicole was there. So plan two uh, has a TC125, which is uh, a first year um, seminar. And uh, it was me, Peniel Joseph, and John Marung Gonzalez. Oh, nice. Uh, just riffing, really. Just, just improvising jazz, yeah. you know. <laughs> Great questions. I had to leave in the middle of a fantastic question about, you know, if there is an electoral change, what needs to happen, presuming that if, if we in fact think that there are racially divisive things happening at the moment, what needs to happen? I'm like, that's a two minute answer, so I got to go. <laughs> <laughs> I cannot answer that one. Right, right. That's cool. Yeah, yeah. It's, Dr. It's Joseph definitely. is teaching a signature course for the first time this year. Yeah, I, I'm sure it's awesome. Um, yeah. I, I'm trying to uh, keep up with that guy. Uh, we did this thing where we we're like kind of dropping, hey, you know, here's an op-ed I wrote. And he like dropped in like 85 links. I'm like, okay. <laughs> Clearly, I'm not doing enough of my time. No, yeah, you're, you're the last person, Rich, I think is not doing it. <laughs> He's a machine. He has stuff out. He and Jeremy Suri have stuff out like every hour. I'm oh, like, what do you do? it's a skill right to write something but i'm not on that level i i need like a day to write something <laughs> they can crank it out in like an hour oh it's a skill it really is it is oh, if you're just getting on to the call we're going to start in a few more minutes Hey, things going well in UGS. I know you all are constantly going a million miles an hour. We are. We're already. It's funny because just today we are talking about recruiting next year's class of Fig and Trig mentors already for like next to lead next fall's entering class. It just everything's always a year ahead, you know. So yeah. I have to remind myself of what semester it really is, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So it's a little, yeah, it's just oh, always busy, always moving and shaking, but that's what I like about it. So that's good. <laughs> so I don't, I, I've been doing some work with, um, with admissions and, you know, UT25, like these preview talks. Right. And, and so it's great because I can say I'm teaching the signature course hopefully next year. So, you know, because yeah. one thing they always say is like, you're teaching a class, like, not for you, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> Right, Unless right. you plan to go to grad school in your first year. Yes, right, exactly, exactly. I'm gonna admit a few more people are on the waiting list here. The other sort of Zoom reality is when your headphones go out because you've been on Zoom so, so long during the day. Uh-huh. That's when you know you've been working. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Boy, howdy. I've been working so hard. My, both my headsets are powered <laughs> down. <laughs> right. They got tired being in the ears. Your ears booted them out. Well, actually, I started using my old school plug-in headphones because, you know, they don't ever lose power. Yeah, uh, right, right. That's what my kids wear, the sort of like the headphones, the, not the earbuds. Yeah. I've got a colleague who has like the super high tech, like, uh, you know, call center headset. <laughs> it's a little, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I crack on her about it, but she has great quality sense. So I'm like, Dang, right, amazing. right, right. I'm always on so just like out in the open, but there's no one, you know, here. And my kids are here, they're upstairs, so we're all good. So. Yeah, see, I can't do that because I, I, I'm, out, I'm on my deck, it's covered deck, <laughs> but um, what'll happen is that there's, there's birds that make this right. god-awful racket 
right. and they'll there'll be a Blue Jay sitting right over there, just like going off. I'm like, do you mind? <laughs> I, I was actually um, there's the view. So ah, right nice, nice. Yeah, and so I was doing a talk at UC Riverside yesterday for the psychology department, and for whatever reason, I felt like, hey, can y'all hear that? They're like, yeah, we can hear the bird. <laughs> We're all friends here, you know. Right, right. Excellent. So I think if I just want to make sure we have enough time for your presentation, Dr. Reddick. So I'm going to go ahead and start if that's okay. And if students join in totally fine. a little bit later, we'll do that. Um, so I wanted to uh, thank everyone for uh, being here. I'm going to uh, stop sharing my screen for a minute so I can see everyone. There we go. Uh, welcome everyone. My name is Patty Moran Mix. I use she, her pronouns, and I am the assistant dean for the first year experience in the School of Undergraduate Studies at UT Austin. And I work with colleagues around campus on something called the First Year on the 40 Task Force, which is a group of faculty and staff from around campus who are um, looking to make sure that our students have the best experience. And we're trying out um, some different platforms to make sure that you can engage with your fellow Longhorns and also with our outstanding faculty. So uh, we're so glad that you're here at this session, but also that you're here at UT because you make UT what it is um, and you should be super proud to be a Longhorn. Um, so we thank you for, for being here. Uh, before I introduce Dr. Reddick, I do want to let you know that we're recording this session. Um, we will likely, uh, for other purposes, maybe take out some of what Dr. Reddick's saying, right, to, to share with other students who couldn't be here tonight. So I want to make sure that you knew that it was being recorded. Um, and uh, now I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Richard Reddick, um, who is one of my, my favorite people just in general, never mind at UT Austin. <laughs> so I've had the opportunity to work as a graduate student, uh, still as a graduate student with, with Dr. Reddick in a doctoral program, in a master's program. I have been his teaching assistant before, um, and we are also professional colleagues. He teaches a signature course, a UGS course, um, and our office in FYE coordinates the signature course program. So um, it's really my honor um, to work so closely with Dr. Reddick. He is a professor of higher education leadership and policy in the College of Education, and he is also the associate dean for equity, community engagement, and outreach in the College of Education. Um, so again, I'm gonna turn it over uh, to Dr. Reddick um, and uh, we will give him a virtual thank you for, uh, for being here. Please know too that if you'd like uh, to ask Dr. Reddick a question as we go through the event, please just go ahead and put it in the chat and then I'll monitor that and make sure that Dr. Reddick sees your questions as they come up. Excellent, Dr. Reddick, over to you. Thank you so much, Patty, for that wonderful introduction. And it's so good to see you all here. Um, and I want to just make a shout out that I really appreciate you making it here. I know it's after a long day of classes. So I will tell you this, if you've got family, you've got friends who are hanging out and want to come and join us, invite them over. They can say, what are you doing exactly uh, in, 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 at UT right now? So I'm happy to uh, welcome some folks here. So I want to start uh, by doing a land acknowledgement. Um, and I'm having this bizarre problem that my literally my uh, PowerPoint will not let me cut and paste things. So I'm gonna actually tape, paste it into the chat and I'll read it. Uh, but I wanna acknowledge that we are meeting on indigenous land. Moreover, we would like to acknowledge and pay our respects to the Carrizo and Kumakuro, Kohotekin, Kado, Tonkawa, Comanche, Vipan Apache, Alabama Quesada, Kickapoo, Tigua Pueblo, and all the American Indian and indigenous peoples and communities who have been or have who have been or have become part of these lands and territories in Texas here on Turtle Island. There's also a link uh, to Teen Vogue of all places uh, that actually has a really good explanation of what a land acknowledgement is and why we do them. Um, so um, anyway, it's great to be here. I'm really excited to talk to you all. And I'm hoping that this will be something that is actually fun and we have time for questions and answers. So I've got a short slide deck that I'm gonna share I will have technology problems, so just that's just going to happen because I'm an old. Uh, so please don't uh, mock me too badly, but it's fine to tell your friends. Like this guy, Richard, has no idea what he's doing. I'm okay with that. Um, so here goes. And we are live, I think. You can see that, right? Okay, great. Okay, so um, this is supposed to be making the semester of fall semester. It's actually supposed to be focused on success, but anyway, you get the idea. 
Uh, that's all of my information. I use he, him, his pronouns, all of my titles that Patty went through earlier and you see the bottom of my email and uh, my Twitter tag, you can tweet at me. And yes, that is a very skinny me on Wheel of Fortune and Jeopardy. So yes, that did happen. And who wants to be a millionaire? So anyway, we'll talk about it later on. Um, so it's not August 5th either, so ignore that. Um, so a little bit about me. Um, I got this great intro from Patty, but I'll tell you a little bit more. I am an Air Force brat. So anybody who's a military kid knows that's not an insult. That is the highest form of praise to be part of military family, which means I went to 12 schools before graduating from high school. I lived in the UK for 10 years, but I came back to the States in 1986 as a freshman in high school here in Austin, Texas. Uh, I'm a first generation collegian. First of my family to go to college, which has been a constant source of uh, amusement and confusion in the family. Uh, when I do something my mom doesn't like, she said, well, let's see, that's the college thing, you know? Let your kids walk around without, you know, having shoes on college, no, that kind of stuff. Um, I was a Pell Grant recipient, uh, which means that I was a low-income student. Uh, I'm from East Austin. I'm from the old East Austin uh, of the 80s, not the gentrified East Austin you probably know today. Uh, I was a plan two major here at UT. I was in scholastic probation. I, I'm really proud of that because I got off scholastic probation, but I think it's important to explain that our histories at UT are not always smooth. Uh, and I went through that experience. And so certainly some of you may get to that point or get close to it. And I'm here to talk about what that felt like and how I got out of it. Um, I'm a former fourth grade teacher. I used to work in residence life. I was an RA for many years and it was, as a college student. I was a hall director. I was an area director at many universities. I lived in dorms for a long time to the point that I will never live next to somebody with a joining wall ever again. So. It was a great experience, but I'm glad to be out of that uh, period of my life. I was a grad student, of course, for many years. Um, a dad, husband, you can see my family there, son, brother, community member. I'm a board member for two uh, schools in the community. I do a podcast. I just recently became a radio host with my colleague, uh, uh, Lisa Thompson. Brand new, hasn't even come out yet, but I'll let you know when we have our first show on KUT. And I also play this bass guitar, so that's me right there doing my face stuff. And I really like being a professor. Um, even though I didn't have the smoothest trajectory through the university, I really enjoyed being here. And if you had told me in the fall of 1990, you know what, Rich, you're gonna come back to this place and work here for a living, I would have laughed uh, and perhaps cried as well. But nevertheless, that was something I did not uh, <laughs> anticipate happening. I am, an un, I am a sort of accidental academic, we'll talk about that more. So the first thing I want to tell you is that higher education is a system, right? It's not a random assemblage of things. It's an actual system. So my question to you, use the uh, chat for this. Can anybody tell me what the oldest business in this country is? United States, what is the oldest business? I'm looking for those who are quick on, uh, on uh, typing to put something in there. But I also realize that UT students and they're gonna be very thoughtful and they're gonna sort of do some Googling or some wikipedia -ing. Any guesses what the oldest business in this country is? So Dr. Reddick, I think that I- Oh, there's no chat. No, it's okay. I'm gonna say, <laughs> so far we have um, joint stock companies. Okay. Said. Anybody else have any uh, guesses? How about a couple more? Don't be shy. It's only coming yeah. to me, so Dr. Reddick. It's only going to Patty. I have no idea who you are. The, the fur trade came up. Fur trade. That's a good guess. Um, How about one more? Groceries, uh, farmer market. Makes uh, sense. So I'll tell you, the oldest corporation in the United States is the Harvard Corporation. That's a picture of Harvard Yard. Uh, they were established in 1636, maybe, maybe a little bit after that, it's the oldest business in this, in this country. So when I say higher education is a system and it's old, I really do mean that. And of course, it's an old system replicated from a system that's even older. So we're talking, um, I have a shirt from Cambridge that says 09, 1209, right? So we're talking about a very old system. And so that means higher education is veiled, right? There's a lot of aspects about higher education that aren't just transparent. Um, that it's hidden. There's a concept called the hidden curriculum where there are things happening constantly 
if you're not attuned to what's going on, you're completely missing part of the conversation. It's also resistant to change. I would argue the reason it's been around so long because it doesn't change very much, right? So um, those are all parts of what you're now engaging in. And some of you have a couple of generations of experience with this. So you might have a little bit of an advantage and some of you have absolutely none. But ultimately we're all gonna encounter something in the college experience where it's like, what is that? Why is that happening? And so I hope to unveil some of these things to you. Um, so folks like Patty, folks like Malik uh, and I, we're all doing this work to make institution more responsive to all student needs. First gen, low income, uh, students of color, queer identifying students, you know, all the folks that uh, have historically been marginalized in the experience, we're trying to make it more responsive. It's taking a while. Um, your opportunity at UT is really to make your own path. And the great thing is that there's a bunch of paths you can follow, right? There's no points for, you know, originality. You can do anything you want in this space, right? Uh, but your space will be unique. You'll maybe follow a little bit of, of what I did and what some other folks did. And you'll find some other things going on. The great thing about that it's gonna end up being your own unique trajectory comprised of a bunch of different ideas and pathways that other people uh, took on. In some cases, you will be the person who's the first to do something, which is really exciting as well. And you, you know, the exciting things, that's, that's all available to you now. So I'm really excited for you to have the opportunity. Um, so this is kind of my mantra for fall 2020. Uh, this is history albeit reluctant history. Nobody signed up to be going to classes in the middle of a pandemic, right? Uh, you're in online classes, you're in in-person classes, social distancing, and other novel types of pedagogical spaces, spaces that many of us have never taught in. So we are literally learning day by day as we're doing this. Um, some of our faculty have been very, very uh, immersed in this work. But as Patty will tell you, I spend Fridays afternoons talking with faculty members about how do you do this stuff? And if you think your faculty member is the, the guru of everything in the field, how do you do that? How does that happen? Can you show me how you do that? I'm gonna start doing that in my class. So it's really great to think about um, all of us being humble learners in that space, because we are. I don't know anybody who's like, you know, I got the Zoom thing down. Everybody's like, I'm trying to figure out how to do this better. I'm trying to figure out how to make this better, right? Um, and someday there will be a genre of, you know, COVID-19, 2020 films, literature, uh, creative works. So keep a journal, you know, find some way to kind of measure your thoughts. I found my uh, freshman year course planner because the co-op used to give you these bound courses. They still do that? But yeah, the course planner. Uh, and I had that and I was terrible at keeping notes on things. But every so often there'd be an entry or there'd be a phone number written down in there. And I'm like, oh, what was that all about? And I kind of go back to it. Oh, that was when this happened. Or that's when I went to Tower Records and bought the brand new Depeche Mode album, right? That's that's what was happening my first year. Um, a lot of the strategies I'm gonna talk about are slightly different given the context, but I think they can still work. And we will at one point be out of this pandemic sort of virtual mode, so you can apply them then. But they should still work. And you can still think about how would I apply this in a sense that would work in a non-virtual setting or a virtual setting, sorry. So uh, get ready for class, right? So I love this picture. You might remember this went viral. This is the reporter uh, who was doing a stand-up uh, interview and he had this great background and he's wearing shorts and he forgot that the camera actually would drop down a little bit further. And so of course everybody saw him wearing shorts. Um, and I actually think it's important to actually prepare for class like you would if you were going to class in person. You know, try to put on something, right? And as we all know, if it's your first year, Everybody starts off by coming to class looking really smooth and sharp. And by the, the sixth or seventh week of the semester, people are showing in sweats, T-shirts, you know, something that looks, looks kind of clean. But whatever you do, whatever your process is, actually make the physical effort to change and be ready for class, you know. And again, you don't have to put on a sh But I, the funny thing is my kids go to a school where they wear uniforms. And so when they were doing virtual classes, they were required uh, to wear their uniforms. And so my son had his shirt on, and of course, shorts below that, but nevertheless, it does something to your mind to say, I'm actually engaged in the learning process. Uh, the second thing is workspace, you know, um, and some of us have our own rooms. Some of us have an outdoor space to work in. Some of us have siblings, partners, friends, family, other things going on. So whatever you can do to kind of create a space for yourself, really try to make that happen. Even if it's a corner in the room, right? 
And it's also fine if you don't want to have your camera on. Like uh, we've talked to our colleagues about this. Like if you don't feel comfortable, you feel like it's going to be the wrong exposure, then don't turn your camera on. Um, but if you can't turn your camera on, please do. And if you have a cute puppy or a kitten or a sibling that walks through the camera, put that camera on so you can see that person. Um, distractions are a thing, right? Um, I just told you that my kids, I'm looking in the house, the kitchen light's on, nobody showed up. So at some point, some child of mine will walk through here and kind of make faces or say, I need something. So that could happen. So that's just part of this experience. So I'm not offended as a professor if you have to do that. You know, turn your camera off if you have to, or keep it on if you want to. Uh, those whole things about keeping your stuff on mute, that kind of thing is important. But just know that's part of it, right? Bio breaks. You got to go do what you got to deal with. Go take care of it. You know, don't feel that's something we're going to be saying, you know, square number 25 walked out of my class. And that's going to be a problem. Um, the issue of prep work. I really think that um, a lot of us have asked you to do more. But honestly, I know I've told the people I work with and the people I talk to a lot, we're doing less. We realize it's really hard to do everything virtually. So we're trying to think about ways to moderate, but also to give you a whole experience, right? No one wants to have the experience where you feel like you're just kind of logging in for an hour and you're bouncing out. So do your best you can to sort of catch up. Um, plan to visit your, off your professors in office hours, either virtually or in person if it's possible. Most people aren't doing in-person office hours, but uh, I know some people are doing socially distant uh, office hours. Uh, John Bartholomew is doing that. Uh, but make a plan to at least send an email, check in in some way to become more than just a square on the Zoom um, sort of uh, thing. Um, your resources. I'm so proud of UT's uh, resources like the Learning Center, Office of Student, Students, uh, Student Affairs in my college and your college as well. Student Emergency Services, the Writing Center, they're all open for business. Uh, they're doing stuff virtually, they're doing tele-counseling, tele-conferencing, but everybody's doing this. And so we haven't said we're shutting that down because, you know, COVID's happening. Everybody's doing this stuff anyway. So know those resources exist and make sure you take advantage of them. The last thing is have a self-care plan, right? And that is, what are you going to do to sort of unwind? Are you going to do yoga? Are you going to stretch? Are you going to go jog after classes? Are you going to uh, call home and check in with folks? Something that kind of recenters you and lets you recharge your batteries in some way. If you don't have that, it's gonna cause problems for you. And it, it, you know, most of us have realized we don't really benefit from going 100% all the time. At some point we feel the need, I gotta unwind, right? And I really advocate the freshman 15 is a real thing. So if you can get into an exercise pattern of some kind, just if it's walking, if it's exercising, shooting hoops, whatever you're doing, do something that gets you up out of the chair. I'm actually buying, it's coming on Friday, one of those under the uh, table bicycle things because I sit on all day. And I actually find like I finished, I'm tired. I go sit down some more and I haven't done anything physical. That is not good. So I'm still trying to figure that out. So if you have hints for good self-care, things that you can do to keep physical, keep your mind uh, sort of together, let me know. So the rhythm of the semester, and I know we're already in a certain point of this, but most semesters are 13 to 15 weeks long. Uh, the first part I call BTS, see the gif, right? Um, back to school, right? Uh, the first two weeks, and that's really crazy for everybody. It's crazy for professors and TAs and you. Um, then we settle in for the first next three weeks or so, four weeks. Then it's midterms. And I never said a term midterm because literally some people are starting midterms now and they will go until November. Now, how's that in the middle of the term? I don't know. Uh, but nevertheless, that's the period of time when we're all doing either papers or we're doing exams, something that kind of calibrates how we're doing. And uh, then you have to figure out what to do for the final, right? That Assignment is done, that paper is submitted, that test is submitted, you get responses, and then it's like, what's up for the final? I'm looking great, I'm doing fantastic, I have nothing to worry about. Or I gotta kind of step my game up, right? So you've got like about three or four weeks to figure that out. And then we call it Hell Week. Uh, it's exams, papers, and projects. And of course, as faculty, we get together and we plan to do it all at the same time, right? Uh, so one of the challenges about being in a college setting is that you might have a final for three classes on the same day. It could happen, right? So uh, just know that that's something that you want to map out early. So it took me about two years to figure out. I'm embarrassed to say this. 
is to get the syllabi like the first week and put all the assignments on my calendar. I used to have one of those big desk calendars, put everything on it, uh, you know, journal assignments, uh, quizzes, everything was on the map. And then I could say, okay, on November 15th, I've got four things due. So I'm gonna start in October figuring out how to get to those things. Because as we all know, professors love being set here you say, I've got four assignments, I can't turn yours in on time, right? So that piece of planning about, let me figure out where the pressure points in the semester will be for me and make sure that I have those ready. So I'm not freaking out the week that happens. Um, I think you also need to plan when you're gonna meet with your professors and your TAs and also understand that you can meet your TAs and professors any time. But actually, this is a meeting I wanna have the professor to get to know him or her or the TA to get to know him or her, right? You can go anytime to ask questions about quizzes or about assignments, but actually I wanna sit down and talk to this person, put it on the calendar early. So um, there's good old Ben Stein, who I actually know. It's another game store store I can tell you. Uh, but um, I think what's really funny, and I had the same experience when I was a student, I, I kind of didn't really think of faculty as people. They just taught and went behind their desk and slept and woke up the next day. In the same outfit and taught again um but you know they're people too they get they have kids they get parking tickets they have financial problems they argue with their partners they get headaches they go shopping that's all true so just know that's part of what we experience too so everything that you're experiencing because of the pandemic it's likely your faculty and tas are experiencing in some regard too and many of us are doing things like teaching having our kids in our classroom i mean in our houses doing school or picking them up from school that kind of thing so that's all happening um, all of us have one thing in common. We were all students at one point in time. You can't do this job without being a student. So uh, that's something you can definitely relate to. And it might have been fairly recently or a long time ago, right? Uh, so that means that we all have different approaches. Some of us came from the environments where it's kind of like tough love, like you got to persevere through this. You got to, you know, that kind of thing. Look to your left, look to your right. When you won't make it to the university. Some people had that experience as students, right? Uh, some people have the attitude that their job is to get you ready for the next level. So they're going to push you and they're going to make the course as rigorous as possible, right? Some people were like, I understand student development theory. And I understand that you might have been doing classes very differently last year in high school uh, or in community college or another university. So I'm going to help you transition, right? Um, and then there's people who are like, look, how can you not love thermodynamics? This is the greatest thing ever. We're going to have a good time with them with the next. And they're fun to watch because they really love what they do, right? Um, I've come to understand that the topic I teach was the history of higher education. Not everybody loves history, right? <laughs> so I've come to understand that, but I think it's really adorable that people actually are like, this is the greatest thing ever. I've studied this my entire life. You have to love this, right? And hopefully it rubs off on you in some way, right? Uh, talk to them regularly, you know? Talk to them when you're having a, hey, I got an A in the test. I feel so, you know, I'm getting the class, I'm loving what's happening here, I'm enjoying this, I, my major is the perfect match. Great, come tell us that. Um, I'm not doing as well as I thought I would do. I'm really struggling. I can't figure out how to study for the test. I don't even know what's happening in class. Talk to them. Um, also, look, I read the chapter, I did this. I didn't get what you were talking about. How can I be better at doing this, right? And then I tell you, you know what? Sit with five people, in a Zoom room and it's read together. Or, you know, skim the chapter, come to the lecture, then read it again, right? They'll give you strategies about how they think their course is easily uh, navigated. So that's important to make sure that you don't uh, sort of um, lose sight of the fact that we have advice. So let me just walk through some terminology uh, that might be useful. You might be rolling your eyes, but we're gonna just rich, move on. So I'll make it quick. Um, your teachers can be lecturers, professors, or we call AIs, just instructors. Um, large classes usually have TAs. You probably know that already. They're often either upper division undergraduate students or graduate students. Um, really important thing uh, with nomenclature. I've always been rich. I've never had a problem people call me my first name, uh, but not everybody feels that way. So it's highly advisable when you meet faculty for the first time, or you email them for the first time, it's professor so-and-so, right? Because not all of us are doctors. Some of us are have other kinds of degrees. So you're safe saying professor so and so. If you teach a class, you're a professor. Uh, and their last name. Um, and they might tell you, call me Bob, 
call me Dr. Joe, whatever, or call me Sally, whatever. But let them tell you that first. It's always better to err on the side of being a little bit formal, especially with power dynamics. I'm thinking specifically about women faculty who are often assumed to be less, uh, um, what's the word looking for? To, to, to occupy less prestigious places in the academy. We all are faculty, we're all peers. So please use the nomenclature for everybody the same. And if they tell you, oh no, you can call me Sally, it's fine, then, that, then do that. But always start off by calling by the first name, especially if, uh, don't assume that's something you can do. Just make sure you make that point and people will tell you very quickly, no, please call me whatever. Or they'll say, yes, call me Dr. So-and-so, that's fine. Um, Professors come in different flavors, ranks. Basically, there's three types of tenured professors, tenure track professors, assistant professors, associate professors, and full professors. Does that matter to you in any way? Probably not, but it's good to know that. Basically, the longer you've been here, the more likely you are to be an associate or a full professor. Um, we work in academic programs and departments. Right? That's the structure of the university. I told you I was a military brat, so I understand how structures and organizations work. So quote unquote, your professor's boss is likely their department chair. Um, the department chair is related to your dean. And your college school unit has a dean. You've probably seen this person at orientation or the welcome, you've seen them sign things or whatever. That person's the sort of big cheese in their college or school unit. Um, the principal of the university, so to speak, is the provost. The provost is the person in charge of the academic uh, faculty. The provost reports to the president. So if you go and say, hey, President Hartzell, I, I think this class I'm in is really terrible. I mean, he could hear that, but the person to talk to is the department chair and then the provost who might get it to the president. But nevertheless, people think the president is no, involved in those things. And the president's not in charge of the university per se. He reports to the Board of Regents, right? And they're appointed by the governor. So the Board of Regents, you will probably never see those folks but they're actually pretty important. There's actually a student region as well. There's a student who sits on that body that enacts all the policies in the UT system. Exciting stuff, right? Study higher education and learn more. Um, let's see. Um, let's talk about help seeking behaviors. Um, so who on the university campus is here to help you? So every college school unit has an advising team. You may have met your advisor, you may have had a virtual appointment with that person, that's probably the first person you want to access if you have help. Hey, this class is challenging for me. Um, next semester, I'm not too sure about this class conflict I have. That's who you talk to first and foremost. The teaching staff, professors and TAs, we're here for those same kinds of things. We often don't know as much as the advisors do. So a lot of times we'll tell you, oh, that class is great, take it. Talk to your advisor to make sure that's okay. Um, the counseling mental health center staff, the care counselors, each college school unit has a care counselor. That is a counselor assigned to your college that knows your college, you know, somewhat, and they're there to help you directly. And of course, the college, the, the CMHC has access through tele, tele, tele counseling. So you can access them, you can talk to people. And this is really important. Um, I don't know if how many of you actually have, have had experiences accessing or going to counseling. I never did. I come from, a, I guess, a household. We didn't really talk about stuff like that. But when I was in graduate school, I learned that it's really important to talk to people when you're stressed, when you're not feeling that you're uh, getting through, when you're having problems in your life. It's not just about what's happening in the classroom, but literally, you know, I broke up with the person I was dating. Um, you know, I, I'm having a really hard time just being organized and focusing. Whatever the issue is, it's almost always a good idea to talk to somebody and just sort of say, this is what's going on, right? And they'll give you resources and they'll give you uh, approaches you can take. But just know that's super important to do, even if it's something you've not done in your life before. Uh, BCAL, uh, the Behavior Concerns uh, line, is a line, it's both email and it's a phone you can call if you're like, I think somebody I know is having a hard time. It could be a professor, it could be a staff member, it could be a classmate. But whenever you notice that somebody around you is struggling with something, you can either email or call BCAL. You can do it anonymously. I've done it. And they don't ask you who you are. They just ask you for the details you can give, and they move it from there. Uh, student emergency services. Um, the, the unfortunate thing in my time here at UT, I've had students who've had car accidents. I've had students who have had fires in their apartments. And when that happens, student emergency services is a place you should call. 
And usually if you tell anybody at the university it's something that happened to you, we will immediately get you connected to them. And they are amazing. Uh, they do counseling, they provide resources, uh, they can give out emergency loans. They're all available for those kinds of things. And of course, the University Health Service, UHS, um, many of you will get your, in fact, tomorrow I'm getting my flu shot. Um, some of you might do the same kinds of things, but um, whether it's a flu shot or whether it's other kinds of uh, medical issues you have, you can access them for those things. But this is all, you basically have a small city in the university operating for your benefit. Um, a network of support is really the whole university, right? Anybody here at UT can be your advocate. We don't usually sort of say, well, you know, I can't really help you. We might tell you who to go to help you, but if you tell us anybody on the UT campus, anybody's a staff member that you're having a challenge of some, some kind, we will most likely do our best to find out how to get you the help you need, right? That's the one thing I'll say about UT faculty and staff. Uh, this is a group of people who really care about people. And so if you say to somebody in the financial aid office, I'm having a really hard time with, you know, my residence hall, they will likely give you advice about who to talk to in that whole thing. They might be able to solve the problem and they might tell you there's a better person to talk to, but just know that we're all here to hear that. Um, know that if you have a problem of some kind, don't feel that you can't share that with us, whoever we are. And then keep people, folks involved. Um, there are so many people at the University of Texas when I was a student that I didn't have classes with, that I didn't work for, that I just got to know. And, you know, stop by their offices, stopping by and saying hello to them and checking in on them. Because both you're checking to see how they're doing, but they also want to see what you're doing. And what's really funny, this four-year period feels like such a long period of time. It really does. But, you know, those of us a little bit older, I love seeing somebody come freshman year and see them sophomore year and junior year and so on and so forth. So just know that many of us want to see you develop. So don't you know, be a presence in our lives for one semester and disappear. Come back and visit and tell us what you're up to. Um, let's talk a little bit about something that I study, which is we call developmental relationships. That's role models, sponsors, and mentors. So role models are people you observe and model yourself after. Um, you don't have to know these people personally. You don't have to ever talk to them, but they're people you just kind of see like, oh my gosh, they got it together. They're doing amazing things, you know? Um, so it could be your peer, it could be a grad student, it could be a, another person at UT or somewhere else, somebody you see on TV. Uh, we have Brene Brown here as a visiting professor. She's a role model for so many people because of her whole attitude about how to deal with stress and what have you. Sponsors are people who actually know you and their job is to help you learn a skill or a process in your development. So if you're working in the lab, if you're working a job, the person who shows you how to do things is a good sponsor. So professors are often in that role. Sometimes your peers, a uh, supervisor at work is that kind of person. Now, a mentor is really the best of all worlds because that person is going to provide instrumental, which means things that relate to the work or the field you're working in, and psychosocial, which means your personal development support. So a mentor, you could actually share, you know what, I had a really rough time this summer, right? I, you know, I broke up with a person I was dating, um, you know, I had to move twice. That's the kind of thing a mentor is involved in because they're invested in your personal psychosocial development. It could be anybody. Usually mentors tend to be people who are older and more experienced, but older is really relative. Like um, they could be a year older than you. They could be somebody who went through your major uh, before you did, but they're actually the same age as you. So that's not important. Um, mentoring, sponsorship, role modeling, it can be short-term, long-term, anything in between. I've had mentors literally from the first day I got to UT's campus to the present day. And some of those people are still mentoring me and some of those people are my friends now, right? So it can change. And the goal you should understand is it's your, you should really think about having a constellation of relationships like this, right? Um, don't feel you have to have only one mentor, only one sponsor or one role model. Have a bunch of folks uh, in different stages of life, in different parts of you know, people who are just like you, people who are very different from you. That's really important. So um, let's talk about the voices inside your head, the things that you might hear uh, or you might think to yourself that you should really uh, sort of share with each other. You might say, well, nobody's going to notice if I don't show up for class or if I have my head down or if I stop engaging. Not true. Um, most of us have systems in place that figure out how do I track what's going on? 
And most of us have to relax our policies about attendance. Like if you're sick or you're not able to get to class for a reason, most of us have made accommodations for that, but know what those policies are. And know that if you are not showing up for class or if you have your head down, you're not engaged, you may hear from the faculty member and asking, is everything okay? Um, or you might hear from a peer asking the same question, right? Um, the other one is like, I'm the only person in this classroom who doesn't understand what's going on. That is not true. I can assure you if you have a question, so do five other people in the class. And sometimes it's hard to be the person to ask the question. So sometimes the chat can be useful. Some, sometimes office hours are useful. Sometimes going to TA is useful, but our job is to teach. So most of us are very happy to sit and explain something to you. And make sure you've done sort of the preliminary work. You've read the chapter, you listen to lecture notes, but if you've done that and it's still not clicking, make sure you uh, use space for that kind of activity. Um, the professor doesn't like me and remembers everything I said in the class and, you know, good or bad. Uh, well, first of all, remember that most faculty are teaching a bunch of students, right? So some of us sometimes forget that that's happening and we might say something that's kind of gruff or offhanded or sounds kind of rude. Um, I just encourage you to, you know, sometimes it's not personal. It doesn't excuse people for being rude, but sometimes your faculty member is trying to do 25 things and they called you the wrong name or uh, they snapped at you and they shouldn't have snapped at you. And I want to make clear that's not okay, but we're our people, right? So just know that we do remember. And so, in fact, I was talking to a student before this meeting uh, and he mentioned that he had a sister that went to UT and I asked what sister's name was. I'm like, oh, she did her, her thesis on this topic. He's like, how do you know that? I'm like, well, it was only a couple of years ago, but he was like, I can't believe you know my sister. I'm like, well, yeah, you know, I, I know her. And I, I know she works for the Dallas Morning News now. And he's like, how do you know that? I'm not a stalker. I just happen to follow students, you know, when they you know, were in my class or I get to know them a little bit. Um, so nobody cares that I'm having a hard time. There's this really, really bad uh, rumor out there that class is all about, you know, quadratic equations or, you know, chemistry or literature. That's a huge part of what we do, yes. Most of us wanna spend our time doing that. But again, you wouldn't choose to work at a university if you didn't have some investment in young people development. So if you're having a hard time, talk to somebody in the class, talk to the TA professor. We might say, the best person to talk to is somebody at the CMHC, but please let us know when it's happening because a lot of times we actually have some good advice. Um, even if it's just like, hey, I hear what you're saying. That sounds tough. I, I hope it works out. You know, I have some ideas about that kind of thing. Just know where here's a resource. And again, I told you we've all been college students, so we're able to help in that respect. Um, you know, the thing that happened to me outside of class is not relevant to what I'm doing in class. That's not true. We know that if you're dealing with food insecurity, if you're dealing uh, with financial problems, if somebody at your house is sick, that's gonna impact your performance. We know this. So don't feel it has to be about the class specifically. If there's anything in your life that's causing a challenge for you, please talk to somebody. And use the uh, resources we talked about if you don't feel that the faculty member can do it. If you feel you're in a class of 300 and you feel like I'm anonymous, well, first of all, don't make that assumption because some professors will take their time and spend days studying the roster and looking at where you went to high school and that kind of thing like that you might be surprised about how much they know about you uh, but you have to also reciprocate by actually saying hey i you know i'm in your class and i want to talk to you about this challenge i'm having the other one is really funny i'll never see this ta or professor again i was at the uh, heb and um up on 41st street and i remember went to a student they were just like hey dr reddick i'm like hey like what are you doing here i'm like i'm shopping <laughs> I have to eat as well, right? So, uh, and, in fact, this whole situation was really funny because the student ended up locking herself out of her car. And so I had my cell phone, we called AAA uh, and got, you know, she called her dad. <laughs> her dad was like, thank you so much. And I'm like, hey, you know, what are, what are professors for? You know? uh, anyway, so um, just know that we exist and you might have a class with us later on. You might be doing an independent study course with us at some point in time. You may look for us to do a recommendation for your, internship or your job you're looking for or scholarship. Those are all things we want to do. That's part of our job. So some things to remember. Um, I kind of think you should make a goal to have at least one of your professors every semester is somebody you build a relationship with. Hopefully it's more than that. But at a minimum, I want you all to be able to say over eight long semesters, or if you have summer classes, add those as well. I have one person from each semester that I can say 
They can write me a letter of recommendation. Uh, they know my name. They know what I'm interested in, that kind of thing. And what ends up happening is you have a Rolodex of people you can call on for things, right? A recommendation letter. Um, as long as you give us a little bit of, of warning, most of us love to do that kind of stuff, right? Internships, scholarships, recommendations, that kind of thing. Uh, remember, your tuition is going towards paying for these services like the CMHC, like the Sanger Learning Center. So know that we're all, you're paying for this in some way. So make sure you access those resources, right? Um, the faculty and staff at UT are really good at directing you where you need to go. If you need something, so just ask. And I'm guaranteed if you ask somebody and they don't, they don't know what to do, they'll probably say, let me ask somebody to help you get the help you need, right? Um, if you need help, don't just hope that things get better. Um, tell somebody, even if it's a peer, like, you know, I'm having a hard time in this class and, you know, and have a plan. And I think I'm going to talk to somebody at the Counseling Mental Health Center about study skills. Or I'm going to talk to me in the Sanger Learning Center about this. I'm going to talk to my TA. Um, just let us know as soon as possible. The biggest mistake I made as a freshman or a sophomore, really, was not seeking out help when I needed it. I kind of thought, it'll get better. I'll figure it out. And it did. <laughs> it just got more uh, complicated and, and um, sort of convoluted. So just make sure you access folks uh, when you just, like, I think I understand what's going on, but I want to double check I've got this. That's great. We all love doing that. The other thing is like have a growth mindset. You will be successful. Doesn't always mean a perfect grade. It can mean, you know, you learned something. You built a relationship. You really got to be in a space where you understood this is a really tough topic, but I really figured something out about this. So that's super important as well. So um, this is something probably weird to talk about because you probably haven't thought about this. Is there life after college? Yes. There is. Uh, one reason you are here is because networks are, matter. You're going to build networks that last for a lifetime. And so you'll see on the right hand side, there's a picture, and that is my cartoon self. Um, this is a cartoon strip that my friend Carl Reblatt drew. And what had ended up happening is that during the week of this cartoon strip in the Texan, he had um, everybody who ever asked to be in the comic strip had uh, tortured him basically, and they put him in an ant mound. And so I come up on the Friday and I help him get out of this. And I tell him, you know, you can solve your problems. Yes, Daddy Rich was my nickname in high school, in, in college. Uh, and yes, it's got my super long fingers. And he tells me I was bald back then. Anyway, so what happened to Carl Greenblatt? Carl Greenblatt uh, ended up being the creator of the comic series, or the cartoon series Chowder. And so, um, you know, many of you might have watched that show or you might be a fan of that show. And the funny thing is, like, you know, I know Carl and I see him in LA every so often. And he's like this, you know, 40 something year old kid, literally draws cartoons for a living and makes good money doing this as well. So he's like the richest, uh, most successful kid I know and literally has a bunch of Disney figurines parade everywhere and plays video games all day. What a career, right? That's something I knew in college. Like I had no idea he was gonna end up being that person, but it's kind of a cool thing to say like, yeah, I know that guy. Uh, my other story I can tell is like when I was a freshman, I used to hang out on the West Mall and the Daily Texan would be there with their cartoon staff. And I was sitting there and there was this guy who did a cartoon strip with a character named Maricela. And I, I'm a freshman, I don't think he knew who I was, but I used to hang out with him and talk to him. Well, that guy ended up starting making movies. And you might know Robert Rodriguez and El Mariachi and Spy Kids. You know, that's a guy I knew in college. Now, does he know me by person, by name? Probably not. But I bet if I sat down and talked to him, it's like, remember we used to hang out in the, on the West Mall and there was this like, freshman who's always talking to you? That was me. Anyway, so that happens too. Um, so networking is important. So with alumni, people went to UT as well. Uh, professionals who are somehow fit with UT and cool people like Carl Greenblatt. Um, you can get connected to people through hooked in, LinkedIn, or student orgs. So that's why these things are important. They're fun now, but they actually matter later on. I had an interview this week about the Texas Blazers, an organization I was part of as a student that's still around. It's kind of like, wow, has it been that long? It's been like 30 years. Like, yeah, that's how long it's been. So anyway, super important. You're not thinking about your future right now, which is fine. Not your future in the sense of like 20, 30 years now, but it will make a difference. That's what I've got. So I know we've got a little bit of time left. So I'd love to have some questions, dialogue, uh, things you want to know. I am ready. All right, so we have some questions coming in, Dr. Reddick. The first one is, do you have any advice for Zoom fatigue? 
and for introverts who are easily exhausted by all of the Zooming? Oh, that's a good one. Zoom fatigue is a real thing. I teach graduate courses, which are three hours long. I think you just froze, Dr. Reddick. For three hours. And usually done, I think it's about two hours. So um, hopefully you're getting those breaks. And the first thing is to say, make sure you're taking care of yourself. So if you need to get up and go for a walk, go do that. Don't feel like you have to be riveted in front of your, uh, your desk uh, because you think there's going to be a problem if you move around. Uh, um, I think uh, is leading to do. Um, and also reach to me and staff about your concerns. I, I have a group of students I meet with in the College of Education. One of my students said, hey, Dr. Reddick, you know, I am at home. I'm, I'm not on campus. This is kind of going to be a grind. I got to figure out something different. I'm like, well, have you thought about ways to maybe participate differently? Maybe even suggest to the faculty member, or can we do breakout groups? Because sometimes it's helpful for us to hear from you what you enjoy. If we do a breakout group activity, you enjoy that, give them that feedback and say, that was great. Let's do more of that. Um, I've discovered, and I teach pretty small classes, that people really like being in spaces where it's just three or four people that can be a little bit more relaxed. Um, so make sure you talk to your faculty about what's best for you and um, make sure you have the work-life balance thing going. So make sure, um, if you have space between classes to go and go that walk, walk around the block, you know, uh, go check the mail, um, do something in the kitchen. Um, my day to day has been back to back to back to back Zoom meeting, but I made sure at lunchtime I got the heck out of front of this computer, put it down, um, did some stuff on Twitter and just kind of hung out for a little bit and vegged out. When I finish with this, I'm going to go hang out with my kids and just let this thing go for a little bit because it's like you got to find ways to balance this. So hopefully that helps. And also think about the fact that you're kind of playing a role right i'm introvert you're like you're introvert like yeah actually it's more easy for me to hang out with people i know than meet new people and i've been around here for a long time so i know other people so it's a little easier for me now but i'm always the person who says let me be the person to say does anybody want to start a study group for this class does everybody want to sort of hang out and talk about interesting because sometimes that's a nice way to have a little bit of a break and create a smaller community. You're in a class of 300 people. How about saying, look, anybody who wants to get together on Wednesdays at two o'clock to discuss uh, the class reading, if the press is okay with that, let's do that. And fine, that's a great way to kind of help you uh, sort of get out of your own space, uh, but also learn what people are taking away from the class. If you're in a group of five people and none of you understand a concept, that is a pretty good clue that the professor did do the best job explaining it. And then you can go and say, well, I've talked to my five people in my study group. We're all confused. That's actually good feedback for us. Like, oh, well, I need to reteach that. Yeah. And I actually know faculty who do that. They'll, they'll, you know, I heard from several of you that that was a confusing concept. If they don't hear it, no. All right. So I'll take uh, maybe one more. We'll do one more question in the interest of time, Dr. Reddick. Uh, this student said that they're interested in becoming a professor. Maybe yeah. what's one piece of advice that you have for them? Um, that is a great question. And I really, look, I wish somebody had told me, like, that's something you can do. Um, and um, so I want you all to think about that. I want you all to think about, you're excited about a topic, you're excited about the thing you're studying. What would it be like to actually be a person who taught that and researched it and wrote articles about it and books about it? Um, and of course, I mean, most of us aren't thinking that, you know, age 18, 19, 20, uh, but we like doing something. And most people I know who are who are academics probably at some point said, you know, I really liked studying history. I really liked, you know, dissecting frogs. I really liked, you know, studying school settings, right? You, you figure that out. And for me, I had a lot of detours in the, in the field of education. We don't usually go straight through. We don't like, if you're going to be a chemist, for instance, talk to somebody like, uh, you know, um, you know, um, well, a chemist, you know, um, they, they, they will tell you probably they went to undergraduate college, they went to graduate school, they got their PhD and they were done in X number of years. As an educator, I taught for two years before I went to graduate school. I worked in student affairs for a couple of years and then I realized I wanted to work in student affairs and get a doctorate. And when I was in graduate school, that's when I kind of got the idea that teaching would be something kind of cool. And it just so happened I had people at UT who were kind of cheering for me and they were like, Rich, you know, when you finish that doctorate, you got to come back here. And 
I really do credit those people for actually saying to me, here is a job description. You need to apply to this. And, and I'll be in the search committee, right? Those kinds of things. So networking. So um, also the opportunities to do research here are really important. A lot of uh, students really sort of uh, are excited about the fact that is a first year student, so second year student, you name it, you can do research with a faculty member. You might be able to write a paper with a faculty member or go to a conference and present or with a graduate student. So getting those opportunities to do things that are connected to the field are super important uh, because you get a sense of what it's like to be a faculty member. Now, obviously, I would say sort of being a faculty member, there's no way to replicate that. But writing a paper together would probably be a pretty good idea of doing it. Collecting data on a project, probably pretty close to it. Do you enjoy it? Do you want to learn more about it? Does it energize you? Do you like talking to people about your work? Do you like talking to other people about the topic you're talking about? Um, that's a big part of what we do. Um, and you know, the thing about being an academic is really interesting is that it's a, I, I say it's a very selfish lifestyle. I spend a lot of time thinking about what I want to do. And I'm at a point in my career where I get to do things kind of when I want to do them, right? I go to work when I teach classes, but the rest of my day, you know, I was at UC Riverside virtually yesterday. Um, you know, you get to go to different campuses and visit and give talks. Um, you get to pursue things you're interested in doing. That's the best thing. Like, if I like want to study, you know, what it's like to be a staff member at UT, I can say, hey, hey, Patty, hey, Malik, let's get together and I'll, I'm doing a study. I can do that. It, it's super cool and interesting. And the most fun thing I think is, when I walk past Welch Hall, <laughs> Welch Hall is a place that kicked my ass <laughs> as a student. I'm like, I work here now. <laughs> like, I, you know, I, I kind of I figured that out. I got I got through that experience, which I think is super empowering. And I again, I think about my 18 year old self and you know, wish I could come to say, hey, you know, you're gonna get through this. You know, it'll be challenging, but you'll figure it out. And that's only because I had uh, the resources and the wherewithal and mentors to support me in that process. But I'm so excited to hear that. Talk to faculty about their journeys. That's really important too. How did you become a professor? Because some people will tell you, I was born wanting to do this. And some people will tell you, I was working at a newspaper and then I decided I wanted to do this. My good friend, Bob Jensen, that's his story. Worked in the newspaper for many years, says, hey, I wanna study this stuff more in depth and became a professor. Right, that's excellent. And then again, that goes back to the point of making connections, right? And, and that the fact that you have them now and then you have them, they sort of build for years to come. Um, so in the interest of time, I'm going to go ahead and uh, thanks everyone for being here and a uh, th big thank you to Dr. Reddick for uh, spending his time and hopefully also showing you that again, UT faculty members do want to connect with students. Um, so don't be shy about reaching out to them. Um, and like Dr. Reddick said, I thought it was great advice to have one professor every semester who you really make that connection with. And that I think makes it much more realistic and, and, uh, and feasible. Um, so thank you all so much for being here. We really appreciate you and we are glad that you're here. Um, and thanks again to Dr. Reddick for your time today. We appreciate you. Absolutely, hook them horns, uh, have a great rest of the semester. And as Patty said, also understand a lot of us, we're shy too, right? So don't assume that the professor <laughs> is a super confident person and has no problem meeting people. A lot of us really worry about, most of us still get butterflies in the stomach first day of class. We worry about how you think about our classes are. So tell us what you think, you know, especially if, we, if you've done a good job, let them know. That's really nice to say, hey, today's right. lecture was really good. And if we're not doing as well as we could, tell us that as well. But I think we all walk around kind of thinking, what do my students think of me, you know? Right. <laughs> and it's nice to actually sometimes hear somebody say, that was really helpful, or that was really unhelpful. <laughs> Nicely. <laughs> Nicely, right. right. <laughs> Well, good. Thank you all so much. I'll stay on for another few minutes if anybody has any other questions. Uh, but thank you all for being here. We appreciate you. Have a good night. Thanks, y'all. You see the mass exit. Hey, Darcy. <laughs> Thanks for being here, Darcy. You're on mute. No one else. Oh, you're on mute, Darcy. Oh, she has to ask. Oh, hold on. I'll unmute you. Hold on. Uh, now I'm on mute. Right? Okay, there you go. How a little you? extra introversion there. I know, right? <laughs> I know. <laughs> Thank you. Really introverted. That's right. That's right. Forced That's introversion, that. right? <laughs> right. Forced introversion. That's right. Mandated. That's right. That's right. Ooh. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Awesome. Hey, Patty, it'll probably stop on its own, but in the top left-hand corner on the YouTube view, you 
might be able to click on that and cancel it. It I can only view 